Lewis Bailey, The Practice of Piety, a Puritan devotional manual, manual published in the 1600s, uh, written around 1611, real early. This is very early and went through 100 editions. And uh, we can see why it's excellent. It's really fantastic. But I we're continuing. This is number three, I believe. Three or four. <clears throat> number six. Both quick and dead being thus revived and glorified shall forthwith by the ministry of God's holy angels, Luke 17, 34, 35, 36, <clears throat> be gathered up from the quarters in all parts of the world, caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And so shall come with him as part of his glorious train to judge the reprobates and evil angels, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 3. The twelve apostles shall sit upon twelve thrones next to Christ to judge the twelve tribes who refuse to hear the gospel preached by their ministry. And all the saints in honor and order shall stand next to them as judges also to judge the evil angels and earthly minded men. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, to 3, 2 and 3. And as every one of them received grace in this life to be more zealous of his glory and more faithful in his service than others, so shall their glory and reward be greater than others in that day. Revelation 22, 12, 2 Corinthians 5, 6. The place whether they shall be gathered into Christ and where Christ shall sit in judgment shall be in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, over the valley of Jehoshaphat by Mount Olives near to Jerusalem, eastward from the temple, as it is probable for four reasons. Number one, <clears throat> because the Holy Scriptures seem to intimate so much in plain words. This is Joel 3, 1 and 2, and 11 and 12. I will gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them there. Because thy mighty one to come down, O Lord, let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the heathen around about. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat signifieth the Lord will judge. And this valley was so called from the great victory, which the Lord gave Jehoshaphat and his people over the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir. Second Chronicles 21 excuse me, 2 Chronicles 20, which victory was a type of the final victory which Christ, the supreme judge, shall give his elect over all enemies in that place at the last day, as also the Jews interpret it. Zechariah 14, 4 and 5, etc., all agreeing that, that the place shall be there above. And then he's got a footnote here. Near this valley was Mount Moriah where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Genesis 22, Jacob saw angels ascending and descending on the ladder. Genesis 28, the angel put up his sword and fire from heaven burnt the sacrifice in Ariana's floor, 2 Samuel 24. Solomon built the temple, 2 Chronicles 3, 1. Christ preached the gospel, suffered his passion, entered into his glory. Number two. Because that as Christ was thereabouts crucified and put to an open shame, so that so over that place his glorious throne shall be erected in the air, when he shall appear in judgment to manifest his glory and majesty. For it is meet that Christ should be in that place, should in that place judge the world with righteous judgment, where he himself was unjustly judged and condemned. Number three. Because that seeing the angels, <clears throat> because that seeing the angels shall be sent to gather together the elect from the four winds, and from one end of heaven to the other, <clears throat> it is most probable that the place whither they shall be gathered to shall be near Jerusalem in the valley of Jehoshaphat, which cosmographers describe to be in the midst of the su the super superfaces of the earth. And he's got a footnote: the sea beyond Jordan towards Tyrus cutteth into the midst of the world. And Hezekiah says it of Jerusalem, when it's in Latin, uh, that from Zion, as from the center of the law, shall be published to all nations, and there all nations shall be judged according to the law. Romans 2.12. <clears throat> uh, number four. Because the angels told the disciples that as they saw Christ ascend near Mount Olivet, Acts 1.11, which is over the valley of Jehoshaphat, so shall he in like manner come down from heaven. This is the opinion of Aquinas and all the schoolmen except Lombard and Alexander Hales. Number five. Lastly, when Christ is set in his glorious throne and all the many thousands of saints and angels shining more bright than so many suns in glory sitting about him. Matthew 25, 31, Jude verse 14, Revelation 20, 11 and 12. 
<clears throat> and the body of Christ in glory and brightness surpasses them all. The reprobates being separate and remaining beneath on the earth. For the right hand signify a blessing and the left hand a curse at a state. Christ will first pronounce the sentence of bliss upon the elect. Matthew 19.28 And he will thereby increase the grief of the reprobate that shall hear it. And he will show himself more prone to mercy than to judgment. Isaiah 28.21 Thus from his throne of majesty in the air, he will in the sight and hearing of all the world pronounce unto his elect. Matthew 25, 34, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Come ye. Here are, here is our blessed union with Christ and by him with the whole trinity. Blessed. Here is our absolution from all sins and our plenary endowment from all grace and happiness. Of my Father. Here is the author from whom by Christ proceeds our felicity. Inherit, here is our adoption. The kingdom, behold our birthright and possession. Prepared, see God's fatherly care for us chosen. From the foundation of the world, oh, the free, eternal, unchangeable election of God. How much are those souls bound to love God, who of his mere goodwill and pleasure chose and loved them before they had done either good or evil? Romans 9, 3. For I was hungry, etc. Oh, the goodness of Christ, who takes notice of all the good works of his children to reward them. How great is his love to poor Christians, who takes every work of mercy done to them for his sake, as if it had been done to himself. Come ye to me, in whom ye shall believe before ye saw me. John twenty twenty nine, first Peter one eight. And whom ye have loved and sought for with so much devotion, and through so many tribulations. Come now from labor to rest, from disgrace to glory, and from the jaws of death to the joys of eternal life. For my sake ye have been railed upon, reviled, and cursed. Matthew 5.11 But now it shall appear to all those cursed Esau's that you are the true Jacob's that shall receive your heavenly father's blessing. And blessed shall you be. Your fathers, mothers, and nearest kindred forsaken, cast off for my truth's sake which you maintained. Psalm 27.10 Matthew 19.29 But now my father will be unto you a father and you shall be a sons and daughters forever. John 20, 17, 2 Corinthians 6, 18. You are cast out of your lands and livings and forsook all for my sake in the Gospels. But it shall appear that you have not lost your grain, your gain, but gained by your loss instead of an earthly inheritance of possessions, you shall possess with me the inheritance of my heavenly kingdom, where you shall be for love, sons, for birthright heirs, for dignity kings, for holiness priests. And you may be bold to enter into the possession of it now, because my Father prepared it and kept it for you ever since the first foundation of the world was laid. Immediately after the sentence of absolution and benediction, everyone receiveth this crown, which Christ the judge, righteous judge, puts upon their heads, as a reward which he hath promised of his grace and mercy to the faith and good works of all them that loved his appearing. 2 Timothy 4.8, 1 Peter 5.4 Then everyone, taking his crown from his hand, from his head, shall lay it down, as it were, at the feet of Christ, prostrating themselves, shall with one heart and voice and a heavenly sort and consort say, Praise and honor and glory and power and thanks be unto thee, O blessed Lamb, who sittest upon the throne, were killed, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation hast made us unto our God kings and priests to reign with thee in thy kingdom forevermore. Amen. Revelation 4.10 then shall they sit in their thrones in order as judges of the reprobates and evil angels, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 2, 3, etc., Matthew 19, 13, by approving and giving testimony to the righteous sentence and judgment of Christ, the supreme judge. After the pronouncing of the reprobate sentence and condemnation, Christ will perform two solemn actions. Number one, the presenting of all the elect unto his Father. Behold, O righteous Father, these are they whom thou gavest me. I have kept them. And none of them is lost. I gave them thy word, and they believed it. And the world hated them, because they were not of the world, even as I was not of the world. And now, Father, I, I will, wilt thou that thou, should, that thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, and that I may be in, be in them, and thou in me, and they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John 17, 12, 14, 23, 24. Number two. Christ shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. 
that is, shall cease to execute his office of meteorship. 1 Corinthians 25, 24. Whereby, as he is king, priest, prophet, and supreme head of the church, he surpassed his enemies, ruled his faithful people by his spirit, word, and sacraments. So that his kingdom of grace over his church in the world ceasing, he shall rule immediately as he is God, equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, in his kingdom of glory evermore. Not that the dignity of the manhood shall be anything diminished, but that the glory of the Godhead shall be more manifested. So that he, as he is God, he shall be from henceforth in all fullness, without all external means, rule all in all. From this tribunal seat, Christ shall rise. And with all his glorious company of elect angels and saints, he shall go up triumphantly in order and array into the heaven of heavens with such a heavenly noise and music that now may that song of David be truly verified. God has gone up with a triumph, the Lord of the sound of the trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. He is greatly to be exalted. And the marriage song of John. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Revelation 19, 6 and 7. The third and last degree of the blessed state of a regenerate man after death begins after the pronouncing of the sentence and lastly, eternally, without all end. Meditations of the blessed state of the regenerate man in heaven. Here my meditation dazzles and my pen fail, falls out of my hand, the one being not able to conceive nor the other to describe the most excellent bliss and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17, Romans 8.18 Where of all the Afflictions of the present life are not worthy, which all the elect shall with the blessed Trinity enjoy from that time. They shall be received with Christ as joint heirs, Romans 8, 17, into that everlasting kingdom of joy. Notwithstanding, we may take a scanting, a scantling thereof the holy scriptures thus set forth to our capacity, the glory of our eternal and heavenly life after death, in four respects, first of the place, second of the object, third of the prerogatives of the elect there, fourth of the effects of these prerogatives. Number one of the place. The place is the heaven of heavens, or the third heaven, called paradise. Psalm 19, 5, 2 Corinthians 7, 24. Whither Christ in his human nature ascended far above all visible heavens. <coughs> the bridegroom's chamber. Psalm 19, 5, Matthew 25, 10. By which the firmament, as by an azured curtain, spangled with glittering stars and glorious planets, is hid, that we cannot behold it with these corruptible eyes of flesh. The Holy Spirit framing himself to our weakness describes the glory of that place which no man can estimate by such things as are of most precious in the estimation of man, and therefore liken it to a great and holy city named the heavenly Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 2, etc. Where only God and his people who are saved and written in the Lamb's book, verse 24 and 27, do inhabit all built of pure gold, like unto clear glass or crystal, verse 11, 18, 19, 20. The walls of jasper stone, the foundation of the walls garnished with twelve manner of precious stones, having twelve gates, each built with one pearl, verse 21. Three gates towards the four corners of the world, verse 13, and each gate an angel, verse 12. As so many porters, and no unclean thing should enter into it, verse 27. It is four square, verse 16, therefore perfect. The length, the breadth, the height, are all equal, twelve thousand furlongs every way. Therefore, glorious and spacious, 12,000 furlongs is over about 2,200 miles. So it would be about here from, from here to uh, California, the coast of California. Therefore, glorious and spacious. Through the midst of her streets runneth a pure river of water of life as clear as crystal. Revelation 22, 1. And on the other side of the river is the tree of life, verse 2, ever growing, which bears 12 manner of fruits and gives fruit of every month. And the leaves of the trees are health to the nations. There is therefore no place so glorious by creation, so beautiful with delectation, so rich in possessions, so comfortable for habitation. For there the king is Christ. The law is love, the honor, verity, the, play, the peace, felicity, the life, eternal, eternity. There is light without darkness, mirth without sadness, health without sickness, wealth without want, credit without disgrace, beauty without blemish, ease without labor, riches without rust, blessedness without misery, and consolation that never knoweth an end. How truly may we cry out with David of the city, glorious things are spoken of thee, O thou city of God. <clears throat> and yet all these things are spoken, but according to the weakness of our capacity. For heaven exceedeth all this in glory, so far as that no tongue is able to express no heart of man to conceive the glory thereof as witnessed 
Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, 1 Corinthians 2, 5. Who was in it and saw it? Oh, let us not then dote so much upon the wooden cottages and houses of moldering clay, which are but the tents of, the, of ungodliness and habitations of sinners. But let us look rather and long for this heavenly city, whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11.10, which he, who is not ashamed to be called our God, hath prepared for us, Hebrews 11.6. Number two of the object. The blissful and glorious object of all intellectual and reasonable creatures is heaven is the Godhead in Trinity of persons without which there is neither joy nor felicity. But the very fullness of joy consisteth in enjoying the same. This object we shall enjoy two ways. Number one, by the beatific vision of God. Number two, by possessing an immediate communion with this divine nature. With this, this divine nature. The beatific vision of God is that only that can be content the is that only that can content the infinite mind of man, the infinite mind of man. For everything tendeth to its center. God is the center of the soul. Therefore, like Noah's dove, he, she cannot rest nor joy till she returns and enjoys him. All that God bestowed upon Moses could not satisfy his mind unless he might see the face of God. Exodus 3.13 Therefore the whole church prayeth so earnestly, God be merciful unto us and cause his face to shine upon us. When Paul once had seen this blessed sight, he ever after counted all riches and all glory of the world in respect of it to be but dung. Philippians 3, 8 and 11. And all his life after there was but a, a sighing out. Cupio dissolvi. I desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ. Philippians 1, 23. And Christ prayed for all his elect in his last prayer that they might obtain this blessed vision. Father, I will that they... That, that which thou hast given me, where? Where I am, am, to what end? That we may behold my glory, etc. John seventeen fourteen. If Moses' face did so shine when he had been with God but 40 days and seen his back parts, Exodus thirty four twenty nine and thirty three thirty one, how shall we shine when we shall see him face to face forever and know him as we know him, as he really is? 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, 1 John 3, 2. Then shall the soul no longer be termed Mara, bitterness, but Naomi, beautifulness. For the Lord shall turn her short bitterness to an eternal beauty and blessedness. Ruth 120. <coughs> the second means to enjoy this object is by having an immediate and eternal communion with God in heaven. This we have first by being as members of Christ united to his manhood, and as by the manhood personally united to the word, we are united to him as he is God and by his Godhead to the whole Trinity. Reprobates at the last day see God as a just judge to punish them, but for this lack of this communion, they shall have neither grace with him nor glory from him. For want of this communion, the devils, when they saw Christ, cried out, Quid nobis, tecum. What have we to do with thee, O Son of the Most High? Mark 4, 7. Mark 5, 7. But by virtue of this communion, the penitent soul may boldly go and say unto Christ, as Ruth unto Boaz, Ruth 3, 9. Spread, O Christ, the wings of thy garment upon of thy mercy over thy handmaid, for thou art my kinsman. This communion God promised Abraham when he gave himself for a great reward. Genesis 4, 15, 1. And Christ prayed for his whole church to obtain it. John 17, 20 and 21. This communion Paul expresseth in one word, saying that he shall be all in all to us. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Indeed, God is now all in all to us, and by means and in the small measure. But in heaven, God shall immediately in fullness of measure without all means will be unto us all good things that our souls and bodies can wish or desire. He himself will be our salvation and joy to our souls, life and health to our bodies, beauty to our eyes, music to our ears, honey to our mouths, perfume to our nostrils, light to our understandings, contentment to our wills and delight to our hearts. And what can be lacking where God himself will be the soul of our souls? Yes, all the strength, wit, pleasures, virtues, colors, beauties, harmony and goodness all are that all that are in men, beasts, fishes, fowls, trees, herbs, and all creatures are nothing but sparkles of those things which are infinite perfection in God. And in him we shall enjoy them in a far more perfect and beautiful manner, and blessed manner. He himself will then supply their use, nay, the best creature, creatures which serve us now, shall not have the honor to serve us then. 
There will be no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in that city, for the glory of God doth light it. Revelation 21, 23. Nor more will there be any need of use of any creatures, when we shall enjoy the Creator himself. When therefore we shall behold anything that is excellent in any creatures, let us say to ourselves, how much more excellent is he who gave them this excellency? When we behold the wisdom of men who overrules creatures stronger than themselves, outrun the sun and moon in discourse, prescribing many years before in what courses they have elapsed, eclipsed, let us say to ourselves, how admirable is the wisdom of God who made men so wise. When we consider the strength of whales and elephants, the tempest of winds, the terror of thunder, let us say to ourselves, how strong, how mighty, how terrible is that God that makes these things mighty and fearful, that makes these mighty and fearful creatures. When we taste things that are delicately sweet, let us say to ourselves, oh, how sweet is that God from whom all the creatures have received their sweetness. When we behold the admirable colors which are in flowers and birds, and all the lovely beauty of nature, let us say how fair is that God that hath made these things so fair. And if our loving God hath thus provided us so many excellent delights for our passage through this Bochim, Judges 2.5, or Valley of Tears, which are those pleasures which he hath prepared for us, when we shall enter into the palace of our master's joy, how shall our souls be there, ravished with the love of so lovely a God? So glorious is the object of heavenly saints. So amiable is the sight of our precious, precious Savior. Number three. Of the prerogatives of which the elect shall enjoy in heaven. <coughs> By reason of this communion with God, the elect in heaven shall have four super excellent prerogatives. Number one. They shall have the kingdom of heaven for their inheritance, Matthew 25, 1 Peter 1, 4, and they shall be free denizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, Ephesians 2, 19, Hebrews 12, 20, 22. Paul, by being, a, uh, by being a free citizen of Rome, Acts 21, 26, escaped whipping. But they who are once free citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem shall never be freed from the whips of eternal, shall ever be freed from the whips of eternal torments. For this freedom was bought for us, not with a great sum of money, Acts 22.28, but with the precious blood of the Son of God, 1 Peter 1.18. Number two, they shall be kings and priests, Revelation 5.10, 1 Peter 2.9, Romans 16.10. Spiritual kings to reign with Christ, to triumph over Satan in the world, and spiritual priests to offer to God the spiritual sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving forevermore, 1 Peter 2.5, Hebrews 13.15. And therefore they are said to wear both crowns and robes. Oh, what a comfort is this to poor parents who have many children. If they breed them up in the fear of God and to be true Christians, then are, there, then are they parents to so many kings and priests. Number three. <coughs> Their body shall shine as the brightness of the sun in the firmament like the glorious body of Christ. Matthew thirteen forty three, Which shine brighter than the sun at noon when it appeared to Paul. Philippians 3.21, Acts 12.6, a glimpse of which glorious brightness appeared in the bodies of Moses and Eliza, Elias, transfigured with our Lord in the Mount, Holy Mount, Luke 9.30, Mark 9.5. Therefore, says the apostle, it shall rise a glorious body, yea, a spiritual body, not in substance, but in quality. 1 Corinthians 15.43 and 44, preserved by spiritual means, and having as an angel ability to ascend or descend. Oh, what an honor it is that our bodies, falling more vile than carrion, should thus arise in glory, like unto the body of the Son of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Lastly, they, together with all the holy angels, their keep, without any labor, to distract them, a perpetual Sabbath of the glory, honor, and praise of God for the creating, redeeming, and sanctifying the church, and for his power, wisdom, justice, mercy, and goodness in the government of heaven and earth. When thou hearest the sweet concord of music, meditate how happy thou shalt be when the choir of the heavenly angels and saints, thou shalt sing a part in that spiritual hallelujah and that eternal blessed Sabbath, where there shall be such pleasure of variety of pleasures and satiety of joys as neither know tediousness in doing, nor end in delighting. Number four, <clears throat> of the effects of those prerogatives. From these prerogatives there shall arise to the elect in heaven five notable effects. Number one, they shall know God with a perfect knowledge, 1 Corinthians 1.10. So far as creatures can possibly comprehend the Creator, 
For they, they shall see the word, the creator, as in the word all creatures that are by the word were created. So that they shall not need to learn of the things which are made, the knowledge of him by whom all things were made. The most excellent creatures in this life are but a dark veil. 1 Corinthians 23, 12, 2 Corinthians 3, 16. Drawn between God and us. But when this veil should be drawn aside, then shall we see God face to face and know him as we, as we are known. We shall know the power of the Father, the wisdom of the Son, the grace of the Holy Spirit, and the indivisible nature of the Blessed Trinity. And in him we shall know not only all our friends who died in the faith of Christ, but also all the faithful that ever were or ever shall be. For number one, Christ tells his Jews that they shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the apostles, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. Luke 13, 28. Therefore we shall know them. Number two. Adam in his innocency knew Eve to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Genesis 2, 20, 2.23. As soon as he walked, as soon as he, as soon as he waked, much more than shall we know our kindred when we shall awake perfected and glorified in the resurrection. Number three. The apostles knew Christ after his resurrection and the saints which rose with him and appeared in the holy city. Matthew 26.53. Number four, Peter, James, and John knew Moses and Elias in the transfiguration. Matthew, seven, Matthew 17, 4. How much more shall we know one another when we shall be all be glorified? Number five, divas knew Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Or dives, D-I-V-E-S. Luke 16, 23. Much more shall the elect know one another in heaven. Number six, Christ says that the 12 apostles shall sit upon 12 thrones. Matthew 19, 28, to judge at that day the twelve tribes. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3. Therefore they shall be known, and consequently the rest of the saints. Number seven. Paul says that at the last day we shall know as we are known of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. And Augustine, out of this place, comforted the widow, assuring her that as in this life she saw her husband with external eyes, so in the life to come she should know his heart. And what were all his thoughts and imaginations? Then husbands and wives, look to your actions and thoughts, for all shall be made manifest in one day. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Number eight. The faithful in the Old Testament are said to be gathered to their fathers. Genesis 25, 35. 2 Kings 22. Therefore the knowledge of our friends remains. Number nine. Love never fail, falleth, never falleth away. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Therefore knowledge, the ground thereof, remains in another life. Number ten. Because the last day shall be a declaration of the just judgment of God, when he shall reward every man according to his works. Romans 2.5, Revelation 22.12, Ecclesiastes 12.14, Romans 2.16. And if everyone's work be brought to light, much more the worker. And if wicked men shall account for every idle word, Matthew 12.36, much more shall the idle speakers themselves be known. And if the persons be not known, in vain are the words works made manifest. Therefore, says the apostle, Every man shall appear to account for the work that he hath done in his body, etc. 1 Corinthians 5.10 That the respective diversities of degrees and callings in magistry, ministry, and economy shall cease. Yes, Christ shall then cease to rule as he is mediator. 1 Corinthians 15.14.28 And rule all in all as he is God, equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The greatest knowledge that men can attain to in this life. 1 Corinthians 13.11 comes as far short is the knowledge which we shall have in heaven, as the knowledge of a child that cannot yet speak comes in the knowledge of the greatest philosopher in the world. They who thirst for knowledge, let them long to be students of this university. For all the light by which we know anything in this world is nothing but the very shadow of God. But when we shall know God in heaven, we shall in him know the manner of the work of creation, the mysteries of the work of our redemption. Yea, so much knowledge as a creature could possibly conceive and comprehend of the creator and his works. But whilst we are in this life, we may say with Job, uh, Job 26, 14, how little a portion here we of him. Number two, they shall love God with a perfect and an absolute a love as possible as a creature can have. The manner of loving God is to love for himself, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. The measure is to love him without measure. For in this life, knowing God is but in part, we love him but in part. But when the elect in heaven shall fully keep God, fully know God, then they shall perfectly love God. And for the infinite causes of love, which they shall know to be in him, they shall be infinitely ravished with the love of him. Number three. They shall be filled with all manner of divine pleasures. At thy right hand, says David, there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 11. Yes, they shall drink, saith he, out of the rivers of pleasure. 
Psalm 36, 8, for as soon as the soul is admitted into the actual fruition of the ben beneficial essence of God, she hath all the goodness, beauty, glory, perfection of all creatures and all the world united together, as at once presented to her in the sight of God. <clears throat> if any delight in fairness, the fairest beauty is but a dusky shadow to come. He that delighteth in pleasure shall find infinite varieties without either interruption or grief or distraction of pain. He that loveth honor shall enjoy it without the disgrace of cankered envy. He that loveth treasure shall possess it and never be beguiled of it. There they shall have a knowledge of knowledge void of all ignorance, health that no sickness shall impair, and life that no death can determine. How happy then shall we be when this life is changed and we translated thither. Number four. There shall be replenished with an unspeakable joy in thy presence, says David, in the fullness of joy. Psalm 1611. And this joy shall arise chiefly from the vision of God, and partly from the sight of all the holy angels and blessed souls of the just and perfect men who are in bliss and glory with them, but especially from the blissful sight of Jesus, the mediator of the new co covenant, the New Testament, our Emmanuel, God made man. His sight will be the chief cause of our bliss and joy. If the Israelites in Jerusalem so sighted for joy, that the earth rang again to see Solomon crowned. How shall the elect rejoice in heaven to see Christ, the true Solomon, adorned with glory? If John Baptist, at his presence, did leap in the, his mother's womb for joy, how shall we exult for joy when we will be he will be with us in heaven? If the wise men rejoice so greatly to find him a babe lying in a manger, how great shall the joy of the elect be to see him sit as a king in a celestial throne? If Simeon was glad to see him as an infant in the temple, presented by the hands of a priest, how great shall our joy to see him a king ruling over all things at the right hand of his father. If Joseph and Mary were so joyful to find him in the midst of the doctors in the temple, how glad shall our souls be to see him sitting as Lord among the angels in heaven. This is that joy of our master, which as the apostle saith, the eyes hath not seen, the ears hath not heard, nor the heart of man can conceive. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, Matthew 25, 21, which because it cannot enter into, into us, we shall enter into it. Number five, lastly, <clears throat> they shall enjoy this blissful and glorious state forevermore. Therefore, it is termed everlasting life. Matthew 17, 3. And Christ says that our joy shall be, no man shall take from us. All other joys, be there never so great, have an end. As a Harris's feast lasted 108 day, 80 days, Esther 1, 3. But he and it and all his joys are gone. For mortal men to be assumed to heavenly glory, to be associated with angels, to be satiated with delights and all delights and joys, but for a time were much. But to enjoy them forever without intermission or end, who can hear it and not admire? All the saints of Christ, as soon as they felt once but a true taste of these eternal joys, counted all the riches and pleasures of this life to be but loss and dung in respect of that. Philippians 3.8. And therefore, with incessant prayers, fasting, alms, deeds, tears, faith, and good life, they labored to ascertain themselves of the eternal life, of this eternal life. And for the love of it, they willingly either sold or parted with all their earthly goods and possessions. Matthew 2.45. Excuse me. Acts 2.45. Christ calls Christians merchants. Luke 19. And eternal life is a precious pearl which a wise merchant will purchase, though it cost him all that he has. Matthew 13. Alexander, hearing the report of the great riches of the eastern country, divided forthwith among his captains and soldiers all his kingdoms of Macedonia. Uh, Macedonia. Hephuvian asked him what he meant in so doing. Alexander answered, They asked preferred the riches of India, that he preferred the riches of India, whereof he hoped at shortly to be master, before all that his father Philip had in Macedonia. And should not Christians then prefer the eternal riches of heaven, so greatly renowned, which they shall enjoy ere so long, before the corruptible things of this world, which last but for a season. Abraham and Sarah left their own country and possessions to look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, 10, 15, 16. And therefore brought, bought no land, only, but only a place of burial. David preferred one day in this place before a thousand elsewhere, yea, to be a doorkeeper in the house of God rather than to dwell in the richest tabernacle of wickedness. Elias earnestly besought the Lord to receive his soul into his kingdom, 1 Kings 19.4, and went willingly, though in a fiery ch chariot, thither, 2 Kings 2.11. Paul, having once seen heaven, continually desired to be dissolved that he might be with Christ, Philippians 1.23. Peter, having espied but a glimpse of that eternal glory in the mount, wished that he might dwell there with all the, all the days of his life, saying, Master, is it good for us to be here? 
Matthew 17.4 How much better does Peter now think it to be in heaven itself? Christ, a little before his death, prayed his Father to receive him into that excellent glory. John 17.5 and the apostle witnessed that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Hebrews 11.2. Yes, speaking of Christ. If a man did but once see these joys, if it were possible, he would endure a hundred details to enjoy that happiness but one day. Augustine said that he would be content to endure the torments of hell to gain this joy rather than to, rather than to lose it. Ignatian, Ignatius, Paul's scholar, <clears throat> being threatened as it were, as he was about to go suffer with the cruelty of torments, answered with great courage of faith, fire, gallows, beasts, breaking of my bones, quartering of my members, crushing of my body, all the torments of the devil together, let them come upon me, so I may enjoy my Lord Jesus and his kingdom. The like constancy showed Polycarp, who could not be moved by any terrors of any kind of death, he be, he could not be moved to deny Christ in his last measure. With the like resolution, Basil answered his persecutors when they would terrify him with death. I will never, he said, fear death, which can do more than restore me to him that made me. If Ruth left her own country and followed Naomi, her mother-in-law, to go and dwell with her in the land of Canaan, which was but a type of heaven, only upon the fame of what she heard of God of Israel, though she had no promise of any portion of it, how shouldest thou follow Christ into the heavenly Canaan, where God has given thee an eternal inheritance, assured by holy covenant, made in the word of God, signed with the blood of his son, sealed with his spirit and sacraments? This shall be thine eternal happiness in the kingdom of heaven, where thy life shall be a communion with the blessed Trinity, thy joy, the presence of the Lamb, thy exercise, singing the song hallelujah, thy consort, saints and angels, where youth flourishes that never waxeth old, beauty lasts that never fadeth, Love abounds that ne never cooleth. Health continues that never slacketh. And life remains that never endeth. Meditations directing a Christian how to apply himself without delay the foresaid knowledge of God in himself. Thou seest therefore, O man, how wretched and cursed thy state is by corruption of nature. Without Christ, inasmuch as that is the scriptures liken wicked men to lions, bears, bulls, horses, dogs, and such like savage creatures in their lives. It is certain that the condition of an unregenerate man in his death is more vile than a dog, or the filthiest creature in the world. For the beast, being made but for man's use when he dies, ends all his miseries with his death. But man, endued with a reasonable and immortal soul made after God's image to serve God, when he ends the miseries of this life, must account for all his misdeeds and begin to endure those miseries that shall never that shall never know end. No creature but man is liable to yield at his death an account for his life. The brute creatures, not having reason, shall not be required to make any account of their good deeds. And good angels, though they have reason, that they shall yield no account because they have no sin. And as for evil angels, they are without any hope already condemned so that they need not make any further accounts. Man only in his death must be God's accountant for his life. On the other side thou seest, O man, how happy and blessed thy state is, being truly reconciled to God in Christ, in that, to the restoration of God's image, and thy restitution unto, uh, restitution unto thy sovereignty over other creatures, thou art in this life little inferior to the angels, and shall be in the next life come equal to the angels, yea, in respects of thy nature, exalted by a personal union to the Son of God, and by him to the glory of the Trinity, superior to the angels, a fellow brother with angels in spiritual grace and everlasting glory. Thou hast seen how glorious and perfect God is, and how that all thy chief bliss and happiness consist in having an eternal communion with him. Now therefore, O impenitent sinner, in the bowels of Christ Jesus I entreat thee, nay, I conjure thee, as thou tenderest thine own salvation, seriously to consider with me how false, how vain, how vile are those things which still retain and chain thee into this wretched and cursed estate wherein thou livest, and which hinder thee from the favor of God and the hope of eternal life and happiness. And we'll stop there. There's a, we've got a new chapter about to begin. But uh, I tell you, this is... Uh, may I mean, he's like the Shakespeare of theology. I mean, this is just... Louis Bailey, and how many people even know of him? 
This was published uh, by Solidated Gloria Publications, which was bought out by Joel Peakey. But we thank uh, the publisher of this. I think their headquarters was around Pittsburgh. And he was a, the guy who published this was a friend of Gershner. But uh, this is great stuff, and we should meditate on this all the time and think about it. And uh, what he's doing here is he's, he's laying the foundation of piety. He's given us reasons for piety, which will come later. But uh, we have good reason to serve Christ. We have good reason to be thankful. We have good reason to strive to be holy and godly and sanctified and separate unto God and not waste our time with the foolish allurements of this world. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our brother here. We thank you for this work and grant it to our minds because it is so biblical and good. Cause us to bow the knee to Christ daily, to die daily, to walk the narrow path to heaven, to strive to be godly in all things, to put Christ first in everything. Help us to hate sin and to love you. Help us to love your law. Help us to hate any disobedience. But give us the ability to, to have victory over sin in every area, especially those problem areas. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name.